Hey, new year, new decade, uh, hopefully new you as we uh, get ready, and I am so excited to start this teaching series with you. Uh, the next six weeks just called Steps and Stops because we believe at Miami Valley Church, faith is a journey and not a guilt trip, and we want you to be on this journey uh, with us. And so I started praying as I always do uh, last year, hey God, what are you, what are you wanting to, to say to us as we begin the new year? And, and God just kept taking me to, to one passage of scripture, it's actually one chapter of scripture. Uh, we're really not going to look at it today. It's a two sermon series out from this one. It's, it's Psalm 37. It's Psalm 37. And uh, we're going to look at that in just a little bit. But, but it really boils down uh, to six words. So no teaching outline today. I hope that maybe you can remember six words. Really, it's going to be 10. And so six words, but really it's 10, so maybe you can grab a hold of all 10 of the words uh, by the end. But uh, I've just been wrestling with this passage of Scripture from, from Psalm uh, 37, and, and it really boils down uh, to this. The spiritual journey, all spiritual movement boils down to, to one question. Will I trust God? And if the answer to that question is no, my spiritual movement's going to be backwards. If the answer to that question is yes, I will trust God, the spiritual movement's going to be forward. There is no spiritual movement without answering that question in every situation and everything we face. Will I trust God? And so as we begin this new decade, I, I want us as a church, because this is kind of where, where I'm living, I, I want us as a church to, to dig into Psalm 37, like say two sermon series out, we're going to preach all the way through all 40 verses of Psalm 37, but Psalm 37 is, you know, right in the middle of your Bible, there's this ancient hymn book, we don't have the, we don't have the music, but we have the lyrics, and it's 150 songs, and the 37th song written by David, he kind of looks back at his life, in fact, he says, uh, at one point, he, sa he says this, I have been young, now I'm old. Who can say amen? That's how I'm feeling uh, at this, this point in my life. I, I've been young, and now I'm old. He, he's looking back. And, and there's, this, there's this beauty about looking back at life, but one of the things he wants to tell us as we dig through Psalm 37 is, you don't have to wait like I did. You, you don't have to live life with all hindsight. And so our prayer for 2020 is that as you get to the end of 2020, that it's not all hindsight. And one of the things that God's just been, been stirring inside of my spirit is, and I, and I heard it even this morning with people say, can I set any New Year's resolutions, any New Year's goals? And people say, well, I do, but I never conclude them. And somebody actually said, hey, yeah, uh, I, I want to go to, the, I want to exercise, but hey, if you want to exercise, wait a month because the gym's going to clear out because we just don't follow through. Because I, I heard Bill Gates say this the first time I've ever heard it. You Google it and it's a tribute to a whole lot of different people. But I heard it first from Bill Gates. Bill Gates says uh, that we overestimate what we can do in a year and we underestimate what we can do in 10 years. And so as a church, and as individuals, individuals in, in my life, uh, in, in your life, and in the life of our church, I want us to start thinking about some decade-long goals. 3,649 days from today is January 1st, 2030. What are you going to do with the next 3,649 days? Hey, Tim, God's Word says, I don't know that I'm going to get tomorrow, and you're absolutely right. You don't know. God's Word also says we should make our plans counting on God to direct our steps. And, and part of this is Psalm 37. As I've, I've been wrestling through, I was, I was young, now I'm old, and I look back. And part of this I'm blaming on social media, because you saw as uh, 2019 ended the, the decade challenge, right? Post a picture of you in 2009, post a picture of you in 2019, notice the difference. And I just want to know, what are your spiritual goals? What do you want to look like 3,649 days from today in your relationship with God? Hey, Tim, I, I don't know. I want you to start thinking about I don't want you to just think about uh, year-long goals. I want you to think about decade-long. For some of you, that means uh, you're 15. 10 years from now, you'll be 25. High school's over, college is over, career has started. Uh, what do you want to look like? For some of you, that means you're, you're raising children and your child's now seven. Uh, 3,649 days from now, they're going to be 17. What spiritual truths do you want to impart into their lives before they leave your house at age 18? If you don't get intentional about it now, what do you want to do? 55. 3,649 days from today, I'll be 65. And there are some things that God's beginning to stir inside of my heart that I want to see happen. Because, you see, as of today, I'm 20,253 days old. That means January 1st, I'll be 23,902 days old, if God gives me those days. Tim, that's just silly. Why are you talking about that? You've been around Miami Valley Church long enough. If not, this is your first time. You know, I, I rely heavily on this scripture that God says, teach us to number our days 
so that we may gain a heart of wisdom. Most of the time we look backwards as we number our days. What did I do with the first 20,000 days? I, I kind of failed here, here, and here. What about, what about looking at the next 3,649 days? Should God be so gracious to give them to you that, that you number those days and you say, I want to gain a heart of wisdom. So I can go, I, I was young, but now, now I'm old. And I was intentional about the days that God had given me. So David's, David's challenging us in Psalm 37 to, to think long term, think lifelong. What are you going to do with the next decade? Physically, spiritually, relationally? But what do you want to see happen? And it's okay to dream that dream. But David's looking at life. I was young, now I'm old. I'm looking back at life, and there's so much in life and so much in the world. There's, there's so much injustice around, and, 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 and evil people prosper, and good people suffer. Why is that going on? And David boils it down uh, to six words. This is, our, this is our theme, my theme for my life, and hopefully our theme for our church's life for the next decade, Psalm 37, 3. And if, and if you're thinking about it in more terms, it's Psalm 37, 3a, just the first half of verse 3. And it boils down to six words, and the six words very simple are these. Trust the Lord and do good. Whatever happens over these next 3,649 uh, days, those two things have to happen in my life every single day. I need to trust the Lord, and I need to spend part of my time doing good. Trust the Lord and do good. Trust the Lord and do good. Trust the Lord. What's that going to look like? I don't know exactly. But I know that's what he's going to call me to do. Six words, trust the Lord and do good. And so over the next year, you're going to hear some sermon series that are about trusting the Lord, including this one. You're going to hear some sermon series about what it means to do good. And we're just going to go over and over and over these principles. Trust the Lord and do good. Trust the Lord and do good. Trust the Lord and do good. Because there's no spiritual movement if we don't trust the Lord. There's no doing good if we don't trust the Lord. How are we going to do that? But there's one other verse that comes from Psalm 37 that's really the, the framework of, of this uh, teaching series that's just been beating in my heart uh, literally for decades, but, but a lot this last year, and it's, it's this verse. It's uh, Psalm 37, 23. The steps of a good person are ordered by the Lord. Uh, there stops also. Uh, if you're following along, when we put up scriptures uh, on, on this one in the lower right-hand corner, it showed you what translation of the Bible it's from or, or what par English paraphrase that it's from. And those of you that are familiar with all the English translations and paraphrases out there, like uh, PCJP, P I, I don't know that one. I don't, yeah, you don't know that one because it stands for Peggy Joan Cox paraphrase. That's my mom. This was a scripture that she instilled in me from the time I was a little boy. Steps of a good person are ordered by the Lord, there stops also. And I know, she, I know she did that over and over, but the first vivid memory I have of her really driving this home into me, I'm, I'm a freshman in high school, and I run for freshman class president, and I get beat by Kelly Stein. And I come home crushed. My mom picked me up that day, and she knew something had happened, and she knew I'd been beat, and she simply said, hey, my precious son, the steps of a good person are ordered by the Lord. They're stops also. And over the course of my life, I can't tell you the number of times, she would just send me a card, and the only thing that would be in the card was just that, that verse. She knew I was hurting. She knew something bad had happened. Even something good had happened. Hey, just, just want you to remember. And then she just signed it the way she signed all of my cards, the steps of a good person are ordered by the Lord. And, and friends, there's no spiritual movement if we don't rest here, there's, there's got to be, be a place where trust begins because uh, spiritual movement is anchored in this question, do I trust God or not? Do I trust every step that I take? Do I trust it when he stops me? But, but make, no, make no mistake, this is excruciatingly hard and difficult to trust the Lord. There's a couple got up and got ready for church because it's the new year. By the way, your friends are making New Year's resolutions, so why aren't you inviting them to church? Because some of their New Year's resolutions are, hey, I want to get back involved in church. A couple gets up, gets ready, gets their two children ready, hop in the car, drive to church, get in the parking lot, get out, walk in. They separate. He takes uh, the fourth grader downstairs and registers him. Uh, she takes the kindergartner upstairs, registers the kindergartner, and, and they meet back in the little cafe, and they each get a cup of coffee. They're walking with their cup of coffee and uh, they get to the door of the sanctuary where, where they enter and he just looks at her and is like, hey, I, I'm going to sit this one out. I, I just can't. I just can't. Oh, I'm, I'm going to sit this one out today. And she nods and she's okay and she knows what's going on inside of his heart. And It was a big step for him to even say he'd go to church today. 
And all of a sudden, he grabs his cup of coffee, and uh, he, he walks back out towards the cafe, and he starts greeting people, saying hi, and they don't know who he is, and he doesn't know who he is. He's just, he's just playing the church game. Hi, how are you doing this morning? All of a sudden, he becomes this informal church greeter. And all of a sudden, he sees trash on the floor, and he picks it up and throws it. He becomes an informal church custodian. And after most people have filtered through, he goes back in, fills up his coffee, and he walks outside, hops in his car, and for the next hour, he listens to a podcast. I don't know what he's listening to. But the wife knows why he doesn't come in. Because all this talk, all this talk of, of God being faithful all the time, all this talk about God's goodness, all this music that God is good all the time, all this that I am his and he calls me by name, it, it just doesn't register inside of his heart. He, he, he's just not buying it. And he's just not buying it because, because he had a horrible, tragic thing happen to his 15-year-old niece. And he's like, if there's a good God, good God, why did this happen? And I can't make any sense of it. And for every person that's like that, that made it to the door of this church sanctuary, to the door of the worship area, there are scores more that just stayed at home today because they're like, I, I, I'm just not buying it that God's good and God's faithful, that, that God's reliable and that God can be trusted. And, and, and for others that are staying at home, there, there are several that are like, I'm going to give this another shot, but, but they're sitting in rooms like this all across the world today, arms folded, minds blocked, they're like, yeah, I'm just not buying it. I'm just not buying it. And, and here's the reason they're not buying it. Exhibit A. Because we all have one. And Exhibit A is that uh, thing, that season that event, that uh, tragedy, that question, that deep wound that causes you to doubt that God is good and that God is reliable and that God can be trusted. It's that friend or family member that took their own life. It's that parent that you watch cancer eat away at their body. And if anybody in the world that didn't deserve that, it was them. And if God would cause that in somebody like them, I, I, he can't exhibit A. It's sexual abuse or sexual assault. It's the tornado that took everything away. It's that unending, interminable season of wading through infertility, of joblessness. It's, it, it's, it's that unceasing pain that you cannot get rid of. It, it's exhibit A. It's, it's the parent that bailed out on you when you were a child and now 40 years later you still don't have a relationship with him. But that's what a father is like. I don't want to have anything to do with the heavenly father. It's, it's exhibit A. It's the spouse that left. It's the child that rebelled. It's, it's exhibit A. And you know what we do with exhibit A? We fold it. So we can handle it. And we put it in our pocket. And we carry it around. And every time God starts to get close, we pull it out and say, uh-uh, God, I don't think so. Did you forget Exhibit A? And we block him off. And it's hard to hear all this talk. And I just want to warn you, be very careful how you handle your Exhibit A. Because over a long period of time, if you hold on to exhibit A, your heart will grow hard, your spirit will become callous, and God will seem distant. But I have good news for you today. Beneath this lid, I have irrefutable proof that God is good and can be trusted all the time. But that's for later. Over the next few weeks, in this series, Steps and Stops, we're going to be looking at some people in the Bible that had a decision, will I trust God? Because all spiritual movement rests on this question. If I say no, backwards. If I say yes, forwards. We're going to be looking at the life of Abraham. We're going to be looking at the life of Joseph, not, not the one that married Mary that we just talked about at Christmas, but the Old Testament Joseph. 
uh, we're going to be looking at the life of Moses. We're going to spend a week on the life of David. And we're going to watch how God develops trust. How trust is nurtured and how with every step and every stop, God is building trust. And hopefully as we look at their lives, as we see how they learn to trust God and do good, trust the Lord and do good, as we, as we dig into that, we're going to start to understand. But, but where do you start? I don't want to start there because I don't think that's the, that's the foundation of trust. What's, what's the beginning of trust? Where do we go? And I think if we want to really understand trust, where do our feet land? When we want to whip out exhibit A, I think we have to go back to creation. The very beginning. Listen to the opening words of the Bible. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, and the earth was without form and empty, and darkness was over the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters, and God said, let there be light, and there was light. Check this out. It says, uh, it says the world, it was, it was empty, and it was dark. And you know what God does when things are empty and dark? He turns the light. And there are some of you, if I were to ask you, as you start this new year and this new decade, hey, how you doing? If you were honest, you'd look at me and say, Tim, I'm just empty. Christmas didn't do it for me. The New Year didn't do it for me. I'm, I'm alone, hurting, I'm struggling, and, 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 and there's, just this, there's just this emptiness inside of me. If some of you, I ask you, hey, tell me how you're doing right now as you start this new year and this new decade, you would say, hey, Tim, I'm in a really dark place. I don't see any light anywhere around me. I don't see any hope for the future. Everything, I, I've faked my way through it as much as I can, and truth be told, life seems empty and life seems dark, and I have really good news for you today, that the creator of the universe, when things are empty and dark, turns the lights on, and he gives you a new perspective, and it boils down to this, will you trust me? If empty and dark is all you have to bring God this first day of this new year, this first Sunday of this new year and this new decade, bring it. Bring it to him, be honest, and ask him to turn the lights on and watch him do what only he can do. And so this, this Genesis chapter 1 it begins, and you, and you remember, it's a poem. It's got rhythm and it's got cadence. And it goes like this, and God said, and it was so. And there was evening and morning. God said, and it was so, and it was good, and there was evening, and there was morning, and God said, and it was so, and it was good. It was evening and morning, and in the very fabric of creation, the scriptures do not begin with trying to prove the existence of God. The scriptures, the scriptures begin with an understanding that behind every craft, there is a crafter. Behind every intricate design, there is a designer. Behind, behind everything that's engineered, there is an engineer. Behind everything that is created, there is a creator. And this creator says from the beginning of time, I am good. A scripture opens up and God said, and it was so and it was good. Will you trust me? And you listen. And off the pages, the very first verses of the scripture, this just explodes. I'm looking for people who will trust me and trust that I'm good. Here's why. Because the minute... You doubt God's goodness is the very second you ditch God's word. The minute you doubt his goodness is the minute you ditch his word. And his word to you is, I love you, I care about you, I'm good. I have something in store for every day of your life. Listen to what he said about mankind. Then God said, let us make man in our own image after our likeness. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. And God blessed them and said to them, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it and have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the heavens, and over every living thing that moves on the earth. And it was so. And God saw everything that he had made, and behold, it was very good. And there was evening and there was morning, the sixth day. And it was very good. And the creator of the universe from the outset says, I need you to trust that I am good. And when I say something, it happens. And when I make a promise, it is fulfilled. And I need you to trust me. Where do your feet land? 
when you're called to trust God? What, what's, what's rock bottom for you? Where, where does he show it? And I believe with all of my heart, he shows it to us in creation. And we're too busy to see it. Our oldest daughter was home over the Christmas holiday. And uh, we're just talking. When she's sitting on the other couch. And she comes, hey, Dad, I want to show you something. I want to show you. She pulls out her phone, comes over. And she says, I-, I know how much you love sunsets. I want you to see this sunset. And it was a spectacular sunset. I'm like, what filter did you? No, this is just taken from my camera. And it was beautiful, the, the majestic oranges and purples and pinks. It was just a gorgeous sunset. And she's like, but I need you to know the story behind it, Dad. I'm like, okay, what's the story behind it? I said, I had been having a lousy day at work. And I'd been grumbling and complaining all day. And I was snippy with people, and, and I was sarcastic, and I was just, my, my wit was, was biting, and it just wasn't a good day. And I'm just not having a good day. And I'm driving home, and I get to this stoplight, and I look up, and I see the sunset, and it's as if God said, shh, stop, look up. And I saw the sunset, and I remembered in creation that regardless of what else was going on, he was God, he was good, and he was in control. And he simply says to me, trust me. And this is why I start here. This might not seem to be a good starting point for you, but this is a starting point for me. And my feet have to land here. Remember those things I shared with you about about why it's so hard? Exhibit A, a friend takes their own life. Happened to me last decade. Cancer eats away at my mother-in-law's body. And we literally watched her wither away in our home as we had hospice care in our home. Happened to me last decade. Parent struggling with Alzheimer's. Going to my mom and dad's home and my mom is struggling. And Autumn's dad in the veteran's home struggling. And I'll never forget sitting in my parents' home last decade at the kitchen table. My mom walks out of her bedroom and it was the very first time in all of her life she didn't know who I was. And she was scared. And she called out for my dad. And he wasn't there. Happened to me last decade. The tornado that took everything away. Autumn's mom and dad lost their house. My mom and dad lost their house. 163 people in the town we grew up in killed by an EF5 tornado. Friends, it happened to me last decade. And I got to be honest, all this stuff starts to happen another decade. And you're like, okay, God, really? I, I got exhibit A, B, C, and D. Where do your feet land? And over the last decade, God's feet took me here. Tim, take a walk outside. See the sunset. Listen to the birds. Hear the turkeys. The animals, not the people. See the sunrise. See the sunset. And for me, it's where my feet land. The very beginning. It's a fascinating story in Acts chapter 14. The early church is, has been under persecution and the church moves from Jerusalem across the ancient Mediterranean world and there's this guy, his name's Paul. He had an encounter with Jesus when his name was Saul. He'd been killing Christians and, and he has this encounter with Jesus on this road to Damascus and he and another guy start taking trips around the ancient Mediterranean world, planting pockets of Jesus communities all over. On one of the trips, he's with this guy named Barnabas and they, and they come to this city uh, called Lystra. Uh, I don't know if you live in Lystra, or does that make you a Listerine? I'm, I'm not sure. By the way, uh, for those of you that are counting this decade, that's Pastor Tim's corny joke number one. And so you can keep track all decade long if you want to. And so, uh, but, but they're in this city called Lystra. And, and, and Paul and Barnabas are speaking the word of God. But, but before they speak the word of God, they, they do this amazing thing. They heal this guy that can't walk. And the people are amazed. And they, and they rise up, and they don't speak the language, but they start coming towards uh, Paul and Barnabas. And they're like, what's going on? What are they saying? What are they saying? And all of a sudden, they start bringing bowls of things to sacrifice and animals to sacrifice. And what's going on? They say, hey, I'm, we need you to understand. They think that you're Zeus and Hermes. The gods come down from heaven to visit them. Well, like, no, no, time out. Time out. That's not who we are. And he preaches this sermon. And in this sermon, in Acts chapter 14, it's only three verses long. And he says, no, 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 that's not who we are. We worship the creator, the living God, the creator of the heavens and earth. And then this is the the summary of his third, Acts 14, 17. It, It says this, yet 
He, God, has not left himself without testimony. He has shown you kindness by giving you rain from the heavens, crops in their season, provides you with plenty of food, and fills your hearts with joy. End of sermon. And I want to know, from this greatest theologian maybe that ever lived, where's Jesus? This is the guy who's going to write that at the name of Jesus, every knee will bow and every tongue confess that he is Lord to the glory of God the Father. This is the guy that's going to write, if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. This is the guy that's going to write, the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Where's Jesus in this sermon? I don't know. It's not where he goes. I think he's going to get there later. But in this moment, if you understand the city of Lystra, you need to understand that, that if you go there today, it's just a, it's just a, it's called a tell, it's just a big hill, and you can stand on the hill, and you look around 360 degrees, and, and all around it are fields, or farmers farm, or crops are grown. And he said, I just want to tell you, I want to tell you about the living God, the creator of the heavens and earth. Look at all the fields around you. Check this out. And he boils it down to, to four words. He has not left himself without testimony. It's the foundation of trust. Here are the, the first six words. Trust the Lord and do good. The last four words, rain, crops, food, joy. Rain, crops, food, joy. Rain, crops, food, joy. He breaks it down. Rain, crops, food, joy. I have irrefutable proof for you that there is a God, that he is good, and that he can be trusted. This, my friends, is a horseradish encrusted barbecue bacon deluxe blue cheeseburger. Take one bite of it and you will be captivated and know there is a God in heaven. I promise you. I know that I just ruined this illustration for all of you who are vegans and vegetarians, and I apologize, but, but, but I need rain, crops, food, joy. A bun that started out as grain in a field, a seed that was planted, that had to be watered from the heaven. Lettuce, onion, tomato, pickles. It started someplace. And I think God, Paul, Paul, Paul drives them back. Hey, don't forget, rain crops, food, joy. Rain crops, food, joy. Rain crops, food, joy. In moments, because I was a young and now I'm old, and been doing ministry with people for over four decades, when people come to me and uh, want to pull out Exhibit A, hey, Tim, here's why I don't trust God. Here's, the, here's how that conversation goes. Hey, they give me their Exhibit A. And I simply say to them, okay, um, what did you have to eat yesterday? And they look at me like, excuse me? Now, what did you have to eat yesterday? Salad. Did you enjoy it? Yeah. Where would it come from? <laughs> they look at me like I'm an idiot, which isn't all that wrong. But they, they're just like, um, my refrigerator? No, 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 before that. Uh, Kroger? No, 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 before that. We're used to having food delivered to us on a plate, and we forget the process. Rain, crops, food, joy. Maybe it's the prayer you learned when you were little that we need to, if you want your feet to land somewhere, when you wonder whether or not you should trust God, God is great, God is good, let us thank him for our food. Rain, crops, food, joy. And I wonder, I wonder, Tim, you're thinking, is this really the best you've got for me? I've got a sibling with a debilitating disease. I've got a friend that's living with pain like you cannot understand. I've got a parent, cancer's back for the fifth time. Is, is this the best you've got for me? I, I need you, friends, this isn't just a hamburger. This is a horseradish encrusted. Barbecue bacon, deluxe blue cheeseburger. And yeah, that's the best I got for you. Not really. This is the beginning of the conversation. It's got to start somewhere. 
and we take it back to creation. Rain, crops, food, joy. Why the scriptures say, taste and see that the Lord is good. I love the holiday season. Thanksgiving to New Year's. And one of the reasons I love the holiday season, because it's at the holiday season, that holiday period of time, it's okay to talk about food. Have you noticed? You can ask people, what do you eat at Thanksgiving? What are your family traditions? What's your favorite thing? Hey, what's your, what's your Christmas tradition? Hey, what's your New Year's Day tradition? What do you eat at New Year's Day? And we've lived in, in different regions of the world, and that answer is different. We live in southwestern Pennsylvania, and the answer is a kielbasa and sauerkraut. Some people in other regions where we lived, it's some kind of pork and sauerkraut. Where we grew up in southwestern Missouri, that part of the country, New Year's tradition is black-eyed peas and cornbread. And there's just this sense we, we eat something different. And, and for some people, it's, it's good luck. But I think it's more than that. I, I think it's a, it's a moment as we think about all these foods. Uh, rain, crops, food, joy. Taste and see. When's the last time you bit into an apple? Crisp apple. Hanging orange. And he just stopped and said, Rain crops, food, joy. This is from the hand of the Creator who is good and he can be trusted. If he can be trusted to send rain that produces food, that produces crops, that leads to food, that leads to our joy, the very essentials of life, can he be trusted with everything else? But this is an important conversation for the guy that's sitting out in his car right now listening to his, uh, listening to his podcast. What do you say to him? To Tim. Exhibit A. My niece. Horrible, horrific thing happened to her. 15 years old. Is that the best you got for me? How do you have that conversation with him? Well, well, well it, it depends. And friends, I understand that I'm, I'm, I'm skating on thin ice here. Because grief and pain, it's real, and it's powerful. And there's so many ways to process it. But, but how do I have that conversation with him when he pulls out his exhibit A? Well, it depends. I need to know when did this happen? Is this three weeks ago or is this 13 years ago? If it's three weeks ago, I simply say to him, I cannot imagine the unbearable pain that you're going through. I cannot imagine the hurt and the depth of what it is you're suffering. I want you to know that this is a safe place for you to even question God. This is a safe place for you to wrestle with your doubt. People here are going to love you. I, I don't know the exact pain, but hey, yeah, last decade these things happened to me too, and, and it was almost unbearable. I, I can't imagine. But, but can I encourage you? Here's what I know is going to happen while you're grieving, while you're in hurt. God's going to pursue you. And he's going to move close. Be careful that you don't take out exhibit A and push him away. Because if you keep doing that over a serious period of time, your heart's going to grow hard. I'm not saying it's there yet, but it's going to grow hard. This happened 13 years ago. The conversation's way different. It begins the same way. Hey, I am so sorry. I cannot imagine the unbearable pain that you're living with. And you've been living with it for over a decade. My heart hurts. But can I, but can I, can I just be really careful here and just say something to you? What I've noticed in my own life and what I've noticed in the lives of other people is this, that sometimes pain from the past becomes a smokescreen for living life the way we want to live it. Sometimes I'm hurt so deeply and so badly that I, that I pull out exhibit A just to shut myself off and start living how I want to. At times my, my pain is so deep that it allows me to keep God at an arm's length. And here's what I know that's happened over the last 13 years. God has pursued you. And God has wanted to comfort your hurt. And God has wanted to heal that hurt. And God has wanted to help you. Here's what I know. God is courting you right now. Why the scriptures say today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your heart. Make a spiritual movement now. Hey, Tim, okay, great. What, what do I do when I, when I have somebody that's hurting like that? When I have somebody who constantly uh, pulls out their exhibit A, what, what do I do with that? Where, where, do, where do they go? 
Can I simply invite you to bring them here to this room? To invite them to come and understand because for the next five weeks, we're going to look at people who faced a moment like this. We're going to look at Abraham. And God chose him and said, I bless you. Now get up and go from the land where you live, which, by the way, is the land everybody moves to and nobody moves from. When Abraham left his land, he was 75 years old, and he had to wait 25 years for God to give him the son of promise. A lot of steps and stops. We're going to look at the life of Joseph, and we're going to say, hey, let's just be honest. In Scripture, Joseph's story comes from this dysfunctional, blended family. One dad, a couple of moms. Dad plays favorites, and Joseph was his favorite, and his brothers hated him because he was his favorite. And, and there we have a story of human trafficking. His brothers sold him into slavery. Joseph's life goes on, and his boss's wife accuses him of something he didn't do, and he ends up in prison. And the scriptures say that the Lord was with Joseph in prison, which isn't exactly how I want God to be with me, right? I'd rather him be with me out of prison. And he's in prison. We're going to look at the life of Moses, who leads God's people out of the land of slavery into the land of promise in a journey that should have taken him 40 days, and it took him 40 years. We're going to look at the life of David. Check this out. We're going to look at the life of David. And David, when he was a young boy, was was anointed the the, the king of Israel. But there was a problem. There was already somebody with that job description and that job title. And his name was Saul. David had to wait a decade before he became the king and got a hold of God's promise. And he would spend a decade of his life on the run for his life, hiding in caves and hiding in ditches as King Saul tried to kill him. He spent 3,649 days on the run, waiting to grab a hold of God's promise. And he gets to the end of his life and says, I was young and now I was old, and now I'm old. And my conclusion, trust God. Trust the Lord and do good. Trust the Lord and do good. If that doesn't do it for you, trust is vital and foundational for all spiritual movement. If you you need another picture, another illustration, it's kind of hard to use this because it's so nice right now. 74 days from today, spring comes. Those things that seem dead come back to life. What are you going to do? If you need some place to start, trust the Lord and do good. Rain, crops, food, joy. One last verse of scripture that I want you to take with you today. Again, from David's pen as he writes a song, Psalm 62, 8. All my people, trust him all the time. Pour out your longings before him, for he can help. What are your longings for the next 3,649 days? Trust him. Pour them out to him. He can help them come true. Will you join me on the journey? Because we believe faith is a journey, not a guilt trip. Join me on this journey, this next decade, what it means to trust the Lord and do good with all of our steps and all of our stops. Would you stand with me? I pray with you. And before you rush the stage trying to get a hold of my horseradish encrusted, (laughs) barbecue bacon, deluxe blue cheeseburger, That is irrefutable proof that there is a God and he is good and he can be trusted. Question. What's your exhibit A? And is it still tucked into your pocket? If it is, can I encourage you this first Sunday of a new year and this first Sunday of a new decade? Rip it up. Toss it away. Open your hand. And trust him with everything you've got. Pour out your longing, for he will help. Almighty God, you're God. You're good. And we will trust you. We open our hand and say, it's really hard. Because we all have an exhibit A. Maybe we have A, B, C, and D. God, today we throw them away and simply say we don't know exactly what this looks like, but God, we will trust you. 
And in the moments where we don't have anything else to lean on, we will say a simple prayer. God is great. God is good. We will thank him for our food, rain, crops, food. And maybe with a bite of food that we even take this afternoon, we'll remember you love us, that you have a plan for all of our days. And we will take every step and encounter every stop. Hearts that trust you. Make us those kind of people. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. If you've made a decision today, uh, we would love uh, to talk with you and pray with you. I'll be hanging around. Pastor Wolder will be hanging around down front. We'd love to talk with you. If you came today ready to give or let us know how we can help put that in the box as you walk out. God loves you. I love you. Today, tomorrow, every day of this decade that God gives you breath, trust the Lord and do good. We'll see you next week.